I usually have an annual physical in August. But this year I had a new doctor, Marion Weller, since my previous doctor retired. Dr. Weller is a young woman about 30 years old with red hair. I doubted that she would conduct an examination, since physical contact is intimate and I may feel uncomfortable. Dr. Wellner's nurse performed various preliminary procedures, including measuring my blood pressure, taking an ECG, and checking my memory, asking me to recall a book, an apple, and a table after a few minutes. I've always been worried about situations like this, but this time, my anxiety was caused by the thought that I would be almost naked in the presence of a beautiful young woman. Despite my misgivings, I quickly realized that there was no need to worry, as I was too nervous to feel any desire. When we were done with this part, she kindly remarked, I'm sure you feel relieved that everything is done. I replied gratefully, Yes, thank you. I smiled back at her when we finished our inspection. Everything looked good, and the results of the blood tests were excellent. When I was about to leave, she suddenly asked, Do you have three children? I nodded, saying that I have two boys and a girl. Then she asked if I had adopted children or if they had been born thanks to IVF, to which I replied in the negative. Confused, I asked why she was asking. She blushed and explained that she was a beginner and had read all my notes before our meeting. I wondered what she had found there, but she quickly waved it off, saying it didn't matter. You need to clarify this, doctor. It's about my body. Mr. Miller, you have a disease. You have been infertile since birth. The revelation hit me like a brick. Has anyone informed you about this before? What is it? I asked in disbelief. No, please make copies of all my medical records, I asked. I was stunned by the news, feeling overwhelmed by the shock. I'm sorry, but I should have kept quiet, she said. No, not at all, I reassured her. Apparently, too many people were silent. About half an hour later, the papers were in my hands. As I waited, my mind wandered. I'm 48 years old and I've been married to Melissa for 26 years. There are three children in our family, Brad, who is 24, Mary, who is 22, and William, who is 20. At least, that's what I thought. Brad is now married and expecting a child, Mary recently graduated from college, and William is in high school. I wondered who their biological father might be, but Dr. Weller's explanation did not convince me completely. All three children bore some resemblance to me. After receiving some of the notes, I studied them carefully in my office, considering various ways to confirm the information provided. In search of a second opinion, I contacted a college friend who worked as a urologist in New York. He called me back quickly. It was Mark Madden. Hi Mark, I need your advice on an issue that requires strict confidentiality and can be discussed remotely. Send me your documents by email and I will review them this afternoon. Okay, please send me an invoice for your services. Thank you for your prompt help. Mark called back at 3.30 p.m. with unexpected news. Ted, I found out that you were born with a disease that led to infertility. I don't think you knew about it. When you were born and you were diagnosed, there was nothing you could do. But we have made progress over the last decade. Mark, could you send me a textbook on this topic? Of course, I'll email it to you within 10 minutes. Thank you. Ted, do you have children? There is. That's what I thought. I see. Good luck. I hung up and contacted the DNA lab. I arranged for them to send me several sets in one day, and they arrived without delay at 5 o'clock. I put the kits in my briefcase and went home. My youngest son William is still in school and is going to leave next week. After thinking about it, I decided that it would be enough to test one of the children. When I got home, I found Will reading in the living room while Melissa was cooking. Melissa, who usually finishes work early, works as a real estate agent at my older brother Robert's agency. Thanks to her culinary skills, the air was filled with the aroma of fish. The three of us tried the crispy cod and salad, which were delicious. I think Mel caught my hesitation although Will probably didn't notice. 
Mel, who is also 48 years old, has retained her student weight and appearance. With dark brown hair and eyes similar to mine, tall and weighing like a young girl, Mel is very attractive. While Mel and I were cleaning, I picked up the glass that Will had used during dinner. After that, I lifted it up and cleaned the rim with a swab. Then I went to Will's room and picked up some hairs from his comb. I also took a swab from the neckline of the t-shirt in his laundry basket and from his sneakers. In addition, I took a swab from my cheek, sealed everything in envelopes and put them in my briefcase. That night, after Will left, Mel asked, What's going on with you, Ted? You look sluggish. Have you had a medical checkup? Has something happened? No, I'm healthy. Most likely, I was worried about meeting a new doctor. How is she? Good and quite pretty. She giggled. Her laughter was infectious. He didn't get up, did he? No, I was too worried about it. Well, I'll see her next week. She was set up for contact, but I told her I didn't want to. She kindly agreed with my decision. The next day, I personally delivered the DNA samples to the lab for accelerated analysis, which I paid for. The lab promised that the results would be ready by Friday, in just two days. Then I went about my business at work, where I serve as a lawyer at an investment bank in Washington, and lead a team of six lawyers. We are located next to the regulatory authorities, a strategically important place for our work. I have been working in this profession for 22 years, and I get a good salary for my knowledge. I have valuable stock options that can bring in a significant amount if they are sold. Despite the fact that I was a little distracted at work, I coped with my tasks. I rode my bike to and from the office hoping that exercise would help me relax. When I got home at 6 o'clock, I found that Mel was not at home, but she left a note that there were sandwiches and salad in the fridge. She often attended various shows and bachelorette parties, so at first I didn't pay attention to it. But now my trust in her has been undermined. I decided to track her location with my phone and discovered that she was not in a nightclub, as was supposed, but in a motel near the Fairfax line. At that time, I had dinner and chatted with Will about his college plans. Despite a successful summer, when he worked in a bicycle repair shop and earned good money, he felt depressed after breaking up with his girlfriend Lisa. I decided to go to bed early, and Mel arrived at 11 p.m. and quickly joined me in bed. Without taking a shower, she seemed distant when I tried to approach her. I did it specifically to gauge her reaction, because I suspected she was cheating, but I didn't know with whom. I didn't plan on trying to have an intimate relationship with her. I woke up early the next morning and rode my bike to work as usual. Arriving at the place, I took a shower and started my busy day. Around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call from the DNA lab. I received the report by email, but when I talked to the specialist, he said a lot of things, from which I only realized one thing, that my son Will may be my brother's son, but not mine. I was shocked. I have only one brother, Robert, who is three years older than me. Robert was always there for me when we were growing up. We were of the same height and average build. He played sports at school and even played basketball at university although he was not an outstanding player. After graduating from high school, he went into the real estate business and achieved great success, eventually opening his own company. He married Glenda Wilson, his college sweetheart, and they had three children, all of whom graduated from college and are now working. Four years ago, Melissa, who had previously worked as a teacher, joined his firm. Despite the fact that she earned well, she wanted a more fulfilling career, since Will was already old enough to take care of himself after school. The news about DNA made me doubt everything. Since all three of my children celebrated their birthdays at the end of September, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that something was wrong. This year, the countdown to Christmas turned out to be different. Mel and I decided to give up birth control pills when we wanted to start a family. It took several months of trying before Brad didn't show up just before Christmas. During the Christmas holidays, Rob and his family took part in the usual big family celebration. After Christmas that year and for many years to come, Mel and her friend Linda Green went on a week-long meditation retreat. 
They left on Boxing Day, the second day of Christmas, and returned for the new year, sometimes extending their stay for another week. The retreat took place at a center in the mountains of West Virginia. When Brad showed up, Mel didn't go the next year, but she went again the next time. Mary was born in September of the following year. While Mary was still breastfeeding, no seminars were held. But Mel and Linda resumed their attendance when their daughter turned 15 months old. In September of the following year, Will was born, and the field seminars continued for several more years. Eventually, Mel stopped attending seminars when she got a job with Rob. Linda, who had been Mel's best friend since college, also joined Rob's new company. This went on for some time. The following weekend, we drove Will back to college. I rented a minibus for the trip, and on Saturday we enjoyed a pleasant two-hour ride. We had lunch with Will, helped him move into his friend Mike Watson's apartment, and then said goodbye. Alone in the car with Mel, I was unusually silent. Eventually, Mel noticed this and asked what was the matter. Worried, she said. You didn't even talk to me. What's on your mind? I replied, I have a lot on my mind, Mel. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Ted, you're not lying about the medical exam, are you? Let's not dwell on it, Mel. That's my suggestion at the moment. We barely spoke for the rest of the hour-long ride. I left her at her destination and got back in the car, then headed to the nearest bar for a beer. I kept thinking about it. I was puzzled by how Mel could get pregnant by Rob through a medical procedure. The only logical explanation was that they had been making love for many years. Maybe it was Rob, who Mel was with at the motel. As I sat in the bar, my anger grew, and it seemed to me that I could see everything through a red haze. I must have scared the young girl running the bar with my gaze. I threw a tenor on the counter and walked out. I had a group of friends with whom I played cards and tennis, but my best friend was Ned Barth. I decided to visit his house, even though his wife Sadie and Mel never got along. Sadie and Mel weren't close, their children also went to college. When I arrived and rang the bell, Sadie opened the door, and Ned was standing next to her. It was immediately clear to them that I was not in the best shape. Ned has a cozy gym in the garage in the backyard. I told him that I needed to unwind, and we decided to do self-defense at the gym. I knew he had a punching bag because we trained together once a week. Without hesitation, we went to his backyard. I put on my gloves and started pouncing on the heavy bag with all my might, as if my life depended on it. Ned calmly watched me lose my temper, but then I started paying more attention to technique. I kept hitting and hitting until I finally fell down. Ned came over, helped me up, and led me into his house. I collapsed into a chaise longue on his terrace, where Sadie kindly brought me some water. When I started to come to my senses, I burst into tears. Ned asked if anyone was dead or injured, but I assured him that they weren't. My emotions turned to anger, and I growled. Ned and Sandy wisely left me alone. Ten minutes later, Ned returned with a beer, and Sadie sat down next to me. I insisted that they keep quiet, and then I told them all the details. Both were stunned. Ned asked, How did you find out about this, and shouldn't your parents have been aware? I thought for a moment. When I was a child, my medical record clearly indicated this disease. They should have known. Sadie asked, What do you plan to do next? I replied, To be honest, I have no idea, but let's not get too hung up on it. Please don't hit him like you hit a pear. Prison is not the best place. I'm not going to do that. I think it would be better if I went home now. She will worry, but I want to avoid confrontation for now. I returned to my house where Mel was waiting for me at the door. Where have you been? I was so worried, she said. I explained that I had stopped by for a beer and to meet Ned, and then went to his house to help with carrying bags. I'm sorry I should have called. I confessed. After taking a shower, we had dinner together. On Sunday, we had a picnic in a nearby park and went roller skating, but we didn't make love that night. The next morning Mel looked disappointed and confused as I got up early and left for work without touching her. I had an appointment with a lawyer in a nearby office building, and I also went to the bank. In addition, 
I went to my company's HR department to change the information about the direct deposit and beneficiaries of my retirement account, which turned out to be a difficult task. Molly Stanton's lawyer informed me about the divorce case in our state, and I told her that my wife, Mel, and my brother were unfaithful to me. This information could potentially be useful. I asked a lawyer to file for divorce on alternative grounds, but told her not to give it to Mel without my consent. Later that day, I secretly installed a tracking program on Mel's mobile phone as she was connected to my data plan, which allowed me to track her messages and calls. I strategically placed three small dictaphones around the house, one in the kitchen, one in the bedroom, and one in the living room. I also discreetly put one in her car. To distract attention, I asked Mel to organize a party at my house on Friday night with Rob and Glenda. On Monday and Tuesday I stayed late at work, claiming that I had urgent business. When Wednesday came I tried to get home as soon as possible. Despite the happy appearance and pleasant dinner together, there was a noticeable lack of intimacy between us. It was obvious that Mel was disappointed. After that, I downloaded all the recordings from the recorder and examined her phone. When Mel went to bed, I listened to her. There were only a few entries. The house was empty during the day. Mel did not deal with mental anguish. She made one call to Rob's cell phone and another to my mom. My mother was widowed five years ago. She was 78 years old and lived only 30 minutes away from my childhood home. The bell rang next. I heard Mel's voice. He seems to be acting irrationally. After the medical examination, he became not himself. I do not know what is going on. Then she called Rob. Hi Rob, this is Mel. No, we can't meet this week. You guys are coming on Friday, and Ted's behavior is disturbing. I'm not sure what's going on. I don't think he'll find out anything. We have to be careful. I think he received some disturbing news after the medical examination. Okay, take care of yourself. Bye. This conversation became the last chapter of my marriage. Although we are still together, it became clear to me that maybe initially they thought they were helping me. But regardless of their intentions, I am determined to make them pay for their actions. Rob and Glenda showed up at 6.30 p.m. on Friday, and Mel and I cooked a dinner of fried burgers, french fries, and salad. While we were cooking, I tried to avoid talking to Mel. She seemed to notice my behavior, but chose not to comment on it. When the doorbell rang unexpectedly, she looked at me and said, I hope you're not going to be in a bad mood all evening, Ted. Without saying a word, I went to open the door. Rob and Glenda were standing on the other side. Glenda hugged me warmly, and Rob tried to do the same, but I quickly turned away. I poured them drinks beer for Rob and white wine for Glenda, and we all gathered on the terrace. Taking a deep breath, I finally spoke up. Mel, I'm divorcing you. You will receive a divorce petition on Monday. Rob, I'm suing you for alimony for all the years that I've raised and financially supported your children. Mel started crying. Rob got up angrily and came over to me. You're an idiot. I'm going to hit you now, he threatened. Glenda watched in shock as Rob tried to hit me while I was sitting on the porch. I managed to dodge his punch, causing my chair to tip over. Rob was laughing at me. Are you angry? You're a hypocritical jerk, let's deal with this right now. Growling, he rushed at me, waving his fists. I quickly dodged his attack and landed a powerful punch in the stomach. Despite his best efforts, he couldn't match my strength. When he was writhing in pain, I didn't hesitate to hit him again. Mel's screams went unnoticed and I tirelessly punched Rob until he collapsed on my shoulder. As a final act of retaliation, I kneed him in the groin and threw him onto the terrace. Glenda, who was watching the scene, stood up and saw Mel rush to Rob's aid. He was conscious and moaning. Mel looked at me accusingly. You had no reason to hurt Rob. None at all. You're just a beast. You could have taken his life. She continued to cry. And I still can and you're not out of danger either. You're a lying person. Mel paled at my warning. She carefully moved away from Rob. I growled at her. Take this worthless man and take him away from my entourage. You only have a minute before I'm done with him forever. 
Mel struggled to lift Rob, barely managing his limp body. Turning to Glenda, she asked for help, but Glenda didn't react and refused to help. Mel managed to move Rob to the couch in the yard and then carry him to the kitchen. I turned to Glenda and asked, Did you know too? She shook her head, denying her involvement. Over the years, I've had suspicions about Rob, but never about Mel. I think they're still together. Maybe she has other men, but I can't say for sure. When I heard the garage door open, I went inside, looked out the front door, and saw Mel putting Rob in the passenger seat of his SUV and driving away. Then Glenda came in, a pleasant-looking blonde, 46 years old, dressed for a dinner party, but with smudged makeup. I offered her more wine, but she refused, asking for an explanation. That's what I did. She was sitting at the kitchen table. Glenda said, Rob always went on winter skiing trips after Christmas workshops. I don't like skiing and stayed at home with Mark. Mark is her son. I wondered where they actually went, but Glenda didn't seem interested. I'm sorry, Glenda, I thought you knew everything. Are you really getting divorced? Yes, undoubtedly. I offered her a guest room for the night and she agreed. After that, we delved into conversations about the past, discussing possible meetings between Rob and Mel in the present. I shared with her a recording of Mel's phone conversation with Rob, thereby confirming that their romance was continuing. At 10 p.m., we sat down at the table to eat hamburgers, discussing practical issues such as future living conditions. I mentioned that I was standing in line for an apartment near my place of work, assuming that Mel and I would share the costs, including the proceeds for the house. In the meantime, I planned to stay in my current home. Glenda decided to go upstairs and get ready for bed. Curious, I followed her to inspect the guest room. She had everything ready, and I handed her a towel and a toothbrush. When she left, she confessed, I've always liked you more than Mel. She seemed to think that I was on a different level than Mel. I waved goodbye to her as I closed the door. The next morning, I got up early and saw that the police had not yet appeared. It seems that both Rob and Mel did not want to attract too much attention to themselves. I asked Glenda about her plans, to which she replied that she intended to live with her mother until Rob left their house. I gave her the email address of my lawyer and advised her to contact him for further recommendations. Noticing that her car was still parked on the street, I suggested that she go with her to get her things, to which she agreed. Taking a pistol from the gun safe, I followed her car as we drove to their house. We found out that Mel's car wasn't there. Glenda and I entered the house, but it was empty. Thinking about the damage I had done to this jerk, I couldn't help but imagine him in pain in a gloomy hospital from a fatal infection or dehydration. I wonder where they are, Glenda asked, and I suggested tracing their location. When I opened the phone locator, I found that Mel's phone is now in the Cumbria hospital. After calling the hospital and inquiring about Rob's whereabouts, I found out that he had already been admitted. I broke the news to Glenda, asking her to stay at home and change the locks. Then I went to the Home Depot to buy new hardware, some for her, and some for myself. In the morning after installing new locks, I handed Glenda the keys and left. But feeling compassion for her, I expressed a desire to return. She agreed, mentioning that she would cook for us. After finishing installing new locks in the house and making additional keys for Glenda and me, I went home to find her there at 4 o'clock. As soon as I entered the house, my mobile phone rang. Detective William James was on the line and wanted to talk to me. I informed him of my location at 204 Western Street and mentioned that Mrs. Glenda Miller was also there. He asked if she was the second witness or the victim's wife, to which I explained that he was not the victim and confirmed that she was the wife. Detective James agreed to come, promising to arrive in 15 minutes. He was a short and stocky man, dressed in a formal suit and luxurious loafers. Glenda invited him into the house where he introduced himself and asked if it was comfortable for the two of them. She calmly replied, No, it's our spouses who betray us, not us. She looked at me and added, For now. James's gaze darted between Glenda and me, his expression unreadable. 
Maybe you'll get lucky, baby, I replied. Maybe. I glanced at Glenda, who met my gaze without flinching. I couldn't help but feel that this was not the most effective way to conduct a police interrogation. James said, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Miller first. Glenda took him to the backyard, where he turned on the recorder on his phone. They talked for almost 20 minutes after which he asked me. Glenda whispered as she passed me. I'm serious. Her seemingly sincere offer looked like a deceptive distraction. Despite my admiration for her and her looks, I was not one to be fooled. Despite this, the detective insisted that he was gathering information and urged me to tell about what happened. I started with the shocking news that Rob is actually the father of my children, which was a recent discovery for me. I explained in detail about our dinner on Friday and Rob's unexpected reaction, as well as our subsequent disagreements. I told him all the details I could remember. After listening to my story, the detective asked, How do you know all this? I prefer not to discuss it. I'll just say that no one informed me. Everything happened unexpectedly. Good. Mr. Miller, your testimony fits well with what the wives said. I haven't questioned your brother yet. After talking to your wife, it turned out that he provoked a quarrel and you reacted. Besides, he's not in the best condition right now and he'll have to be watched for a day or two. His eyes were fixed on me. He was serious. A knee to the groin is not a laughing matter. It can really lead to trouble. But then he suddenly turned away and smiled. What will happen next? I will document this and send it to the Commonwealth prosecutor for a decision. At the same time, I will talk to your brother. Detective James stood up and I led him into the house where Glenda met us at the front door. As he turned to leave, he wished us a good evening. After that, he went to his car. Glenda closed the door and positioned herself right in front of me. She tilted her head slightly to the side and raised it, saying that a hearty salad was waiting in the refrigerator for dinner. She assured me that there was no hurry, and it was clear from her tone what she wanted from me. I was amazed how women can communicate their desires so easily. Without hesitation, I kissed her, accepting the unspoken invitation without hesitation. She hugged me passionately, dragging me to the sofa with her and showering me with kisses. She pulled me closer, and her fury spurred my response. While we were undressing, I stood over her and watched her take off her dress. It was obvious that she had planned this seduction, and it was undeniably effective. It was not a moment of love, but pure passion. I brought her to several climaxes before finally breaking free, unable to hold back any longer. Taking my hand, she led me to the kitchen where we had dinner, and then went upstairs. She mentioned that she sees our actions as a form of recovery, to which I replied that I didn't mind. We continued to make love, took a shower, and then made love again. We experimented with different ones to please each other and reached a climax several times. Eventually, our middle-aged bodies wanted to rest, and we finally succumbed to sleep. I was the first to wake up that morning. I was taking a shower in the bedroom when she suddenly came into my room, causing another flash. We soaked each other, washed and dried everything together. After that, we brought each other to a climax, and then took a shower again. As we sat down to breakfast, we both pondered the whereabouts of our spouses, although neither of us was religious. It was Sunday. I tracked down Mel's phone and found that she was at my mother's house. This realization prompted me to talk to my mother, as I suspected that she might have played a role in my becoming a cuckold. After discussing this with Glenda, she expressed uncertainty and suggested that the details of how it happened might not be important, but I felt it was very important to find out if my mother was involved. Besides, I needed to talk to Mel. Maybe she came home but couldn't get into the house. She showed no interest in meeting or talking to me. Perhaps they are solving some problems. I'm going there. Do you want to come with me? I always want this. I have a wild nature. She giggled. So will you join me to talk to mom? Yes, why not? Let's give them a hint of what we've done. 
In fact, what's the point of making love and revenge if the cheaters don't know about it? We both laughed. When we arrived at my mother Shirley Miller's house, we noticed Mel's car parked outside the house. When Glenda and I went out on the porch, Mom opened the door and immediately told me to leave, accusing me of offending Rob. I defended my actions by explaining that Rob tried to hit me first. Having decided to sort out the situation, I warned my mother that if I left now, I would not come back. Reluctantly, she let me enter the house, and Glenda followed me. Mel was sitting quietly in the kitchen, and as soon as she saw us, I felt like she knew everything. She exclaimed, You didn't waste any time, did you? Glenda replied, Why should I wait? I know your lover won't be able to satisfy me anymore, but your husband will definitely be able to. Mel jumped up, but I pulled her away. My mom yelled for us to stop. She turned to me and said, Ted, you probably ruined everything when you slept with Glenda. I replied, No, I'm free now and so is she. That's always been the case with Mel and Rob. Glenda and I have a lot to catch up on, and we started from the beginning. Mel insisted that we should listen to him and my mother to shed some light on what was going on. I looked from my wife to my mother before finally saying, I'm listening. Shirley met Mel's gaze as she continued to confess. We both wanted children. But when we started trying your mother declared that you were infertile, you didn't even know about it. Shirley intervened. But I had a solution. Rob. Rob could have impregnated Mel that way and you wouldn't have found out about it. I replied, You decided this without consulting me, she continued. Your father tried to bring this issue up for discussion, but was rejected by three votes to one. We considered various options including medical ones, but they all turned out to be too expensive and time-consuming. After all, you should have realized that you were raising Rob's children. Mel reluctantly admitted, We decided to do it the natural way. I replied, you lied, you secretly made love for a week, and at some point even two weeks, and that was good for you, wasn't it? Mel lowered her eyes and confessed, it was awkward at first but then we had a great time and everything got better. I was looking forward to spending time with Rob, he's a good person. Is it true? Glenda asked angrily. What about me, trash? He lied and laughed at me, Shirley chimed in. We thought you wouldn't agree. Glenda's frown deepened. You were right. I would not have agreed then and I still do not agree. You caused my divorce and I'm sure Ted thinks so too. No one needed to get divorced. None of you knew anything. And you've both been happy so far. How did you know Ted? During the examination at Medi-Cal, the doctor informed me that I have been infertile since birth. I decided to do a DNA test on William. Mel lowered her eyes. Now you know the truth. We can get through this together because I know that you love our children. I said, I cannot ignore the fact that you have been unfaithful throughout our relationship, even after the birth of three children. And even when you started working for his company, I bet you didn't stop. Glenda snorted. Well, how many times have you and Rob slept together in the last year? Shirley looked at Mel in disbelief. Mel? Please tell me that's not true. Mel? We fell in love with each other. We had a connection both in and out of bed. That's why we kept seeing each other. I added, yes, like last week at the Shady Pines Motel. Mel looked shocked. Have you hired a private investigator? I chuckled. I just used the locator on your phone. Mel comforted me. We can stop. We will stop. I only need you. Glenda added, I want him too. You can leave with your big love. Shirley, who was standing, suddenly sat down on a kitchen chair looking unwell. Worried, I asked, Mom, are you alright? She began to cry, wailing, What have I done? Glenda added, Secrets and lies only lead to more secrets and lies. You should have told Ted from the beginning. Mel suggested, If Shirley hadn't done what she did, our kids wouldn't be here. Maybe they wouldn't be so bad. You, Rob, and my mother conspired against me, resulting in my life being built on deception and betrayal. After reflecting on my past, I realized that everything I knew was a facade, 
and my entire existence was a lie. Overwhelmed with grief, I sat down, and Mel came over to me. Unable to stand her presence, I pushed her away and burst into tears. Don't ever come near me again, Mel. Glenda hugged me tightly, and the two of us shed tears. Eventually, I got to my feet, and we walked away. When we returned to Glenda's house, we were gloomy. I helped her with the garden and mowed the lawn, after which we sat down to lunch. A conversation ensued and I couldn't resist asking Glenda, Are you absolutely sure about the divorce? You and Rob have been together for so long. Glenda agreed. I remember your previous conversation about how you felt like your life was being taken away. I feel the same way. I'll go with you to a meeting with a lawyer tomorrow. I don't see a way to come to terms with the situation because the anger has been building up for a long time. I have to think about the welfare of the children. Are you thinking about how to explain the situation to them in case of divorce? As a result, I decided to contact them by phone or letter and ask for a conversation. I've made a decision. After lunch, I sat down to write a letter to my three children. In the letter, I tried to express that no matter what, they will always be my children. They will always be the ones I cherished and cherished. Then I sent them all an email asking them to call me. About an hour later, my cell phone rang, and it was my daughter Mary. Dad, are you alright and how are you feeling? It's very difficult for me to get over it. You should know that I love you. You are my dad forever. I'm trying to understand the situation with your mom and grandma. How could they do this to you? Grandma thought she was helping, but I didn't realize that their actions would have long-term consequences. I will never be able to forgive mom for being involved in this. Further actions depend on me, and I do not know what to do next. I hope we can find a solution that is at least somewhat friendly. It's not going to be easy, but I just wanted to talk to you. I love you. I love you too. We ended the conversation and hung up. Two minutes after Brad's call, William got in touch. He looked more hesitant than the others. He confessed, When I was home alone while everyone was at school, I noticed something strange about my mom. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. I'm sorry, Dad. It's all in the past, don't dwell on it. You find yourself in a difficult situation, not understanding the full depth of what is happening. Our conversation ended shortly after it started. It was difficult for Will to express his thoughts. He was always very attached to his mother. That's what I thought. I doubted he really understood much about her and Rob. Glenda was in the kitchen flipping through an old photo album. I joined her, and we came across photos of both our families in their youth. Soon tears began to flow down our faces. Glenda hesitated suggesting that maybe diving into the past wasn't such a good idea. I hugged her tightly and gave her a friendly kiss while we reminisced about the past. Eventually we went to bed and fell asleep together without any intimacy. The next morning, we visited a lawyer named Millie Stanton, who seemed hesitant to talk to both of us at the same time. Despite her initial discomfort, we insisted on discussing our problems together. Millie was a middle-aged woman with a 50s-style hairstyle who exuded calmness despite her gray hair. Despite the hairstyle, I liked her. She talked about the rules of divorce in our state, mentioning that adultery used to be a common reason for divorce, but now it happens less often. She noted that our circumstances are unique, and we have developed a plan according to which we will both file for divorce, and I will demand alimony from Rob. Millie didn't want to involve Glenda in this process because of their financial ties to Rob. She offered to either file the documents immediately or wait until the end of maternity leave and sue Rob. I asked Millie to file a lawsuit at work and at the same time as Rob. It was supposed to happen on Wednesday. I took Glenda to her bank to split up their property. After spending some time at the bank, we had a late lunch at the Italian restaurant Bersoni. We returned to Glenda's house around 4 o'clock. I decided to go back to my house, and Glenda came with me. No one touched the new locks. We entered the house and she looked around, recognizing the familiar surroundings she had known for many years. When I turned to face her, she was standing next to me with a determined look. 
I want you to make love to me on your bed right now, she said urgently. Unable to resist her sincere plea, I picked her up in my arms and carried her upstairs to the spacious bedroom. She laughed playfully and said, You are so brave and strong. Rob definitely couldn't do that. We both got up and undressed, mirroring each other. Naked, we both fell on the bed. Time seemed to slow down when we started making love. At first it seemed strange to be in intimate proximity with another woman on this bed, but soon I was enjoying the moment. She was wild and passionate, taking whatever she wanted. After we lay down, it was some time before she spoke. It was amazing, she said. Taking that bitch's husband on her own bed couldn't be better. I grinned and replied, You're so vindictive. Yes, she agreed, and everything turned out in my favor. Well, mostly mine, I added, but you liked it too. Of course I liked it, she said. This act of revenge was in itself the culmination. She laughed. Yes. We spent the whole night making love until we finally stopped. The next morning, before we went to work, we shared our affection. After taking a shower, we shed a few tears, then packed up and went to work. Glenda decided to wear one of Mel's work outfits, which I suspected was a form of revenge. The outfit was too tight for her. While I was at work, Mel called me and said she needed to go home to pack her things. I came to work in a dirty dress, I can meet you at the house at 6. Has Rob been discharged from the hospital yet? No, he's going to have surgery, you did a great job with him. Where are you staying? I'm staying at your mother's house in your old room, what an irony. And where are you staying with this idiot? We're at her place, then at mine. And what happens when Rob is discharged? It's not my concern. Have you heard anything about children? No. What did you do? I sent them an email detailing the events and spoke to them on the phone. They're going to hate me, Ted. None of them contacted me. You know what you've done. She shouted, Go to hell! And I hung up. Mel arrived at the house at 6, right on schedule. It was an unexpected turn of events. When she got out of the car, I opened the door for her. She went upstairs, and then there was a scream. She was lying on my bed. I can smell her. I can't believe you could do something like that. I went up to her and said, She expressed a desire to avenge the fact that her husband was taken away from her. Mel's anger was palpable as she packed her things, including a bag of toiletries. As she was about to leave, she didn't notice that the suit Glenda was wearing was missing. She turned to me and asked if there was a possibility of reconciliation. I answered firmly, No, Mel. I meant every word I said. It's over between us. She looked depressed but not surprised. Initially I hoped that I would have a happy family like any wife, she began. It seemed like the perfect solution. But things turned out for the worse. I deeply regret this. I can't forgive you. No number of apologies can erase the fact that you had children with another person and cheated on me over the years. Your apologies are insufficient, and I doubt their sincerity. She got into the car and drove away. The next day she went to work. After lunch my mother called. Ted, why are you rushing through the paperwork? What's the matter? What is it? She asked. If you calm down, maybe things will get better. It's not like that, Mom, I replied. She's been having an affair with Rob for years. Don't, Ted, Mom said sternly. And don't forget who was the cause of all this. I remember, I said. Everything was fine until last week. Goodbye. I still don't know what to do with her. After all, she's the one to blame for all this chaos. I'm trying to protect us from unwanted sympathy from others. Rob was discharged from the hospital on Friday. Unable to return to his own home, as Glenda would most likely have harmed him with her firearm, he took refuge in our mother's house. Mel lived there too. I wasn't bothered by their presence, even if they were using my old room or his. But if my mother lets them stay, then she's not my mother anymore. Glenda and I conferred and decided to sort out the situation together. Since I still had the key to the house, we waited until two in the morning before acting. 
I drove us to the house and used the key to quietly open the back door. As a precaution, I brought a pistol with me in case of possible danger. Glenda stayed downstairs, and I carefully went upstairs and looked into my old room. My suspicions were confirmed when I saw them both, but not in Rob's room, as expected, but in mine, the two of them on a double bed. I took out my phone and turned on the flashlight to take some pictures. The room was filled with screams, mostly of Mel naked. Rob, also undressed, had a large bandage wrapped around his lower ribs, preventing him from moving. Mel calmly covered herself with a blanket. When my mom ran out into the hallway and saw me, she warned me. Ted, don't jump to conclusions. I replied, I don't need to. You support their actions, which continue to this day. I went downstairs and found Glenda waiting for me. She said, they must have been together. Mom and Mel immediately came running and Mel was in a bathrobe. The bad boy Rob was nowhere to be found. Mom sighed. They're adults. What can I do? Kick them out into the street? I noticed my old bed and realized that Rob intended to sleep with it wherever I was. Mel replied. He wouldn't have made it. You saw him. I grinned at him. You really tried, didn't you? And now what? I don't have a chance with you. Is this true? Burn in hell. Turning to my mother, I said, You're done. I may still be your son, but no more. It belongs to you now, not to me. Glenda and I left, returning to her house. We went to bed at four o'clock in the morning. Glenda and I stayed close to each other while our divorces went through the courts. Mel and I sold our house and split the proceeds. She did not receive any alimony or other support from me. The judge did not approve of her actions. My children have adapted well to the current situation. The older two communicated with Mel only through a Christmas card and blocked her calls. Will talked to her, but not very friendly. During the summer holidays, he decided to stay with me. He didn't talk to Rob. Mel had met him for lunch several times, but Rob wasn't with her. Will avoided talking to him. As a result of the divorce, Glenda received most of the property, including the house and a significant part of Rob's business. Rob, in turn, moved into a two-room apartment with Mel. A week after the divorce, Glenda and I talked and realized that although our intimate sympathy is still strong, in other aspects of the relationship we are not quite compatible. As a result, I decided to move out. Neither of us felt particularly sad about the situation. From the very beginning, it became clear that our relationship was short-lived due to problems in the past. Despite this, she asked me to continue making love to her from time to time, while she remained single, and I agreed. We had a strong physical bond, and the closeness was pleasant. After a successful operation, I stopped being infertile at the age of 49. Overall, I think there was a definite positive in this situation. One evening at the gym, where Ned and I were practicing self-defense, I witnessed a woman forcefully kicking a heavy pair. She radiated strength and confidence. When she finished her workout, she looked in my direction and jokingly asked, Are you scared? I replied with a smile and raised my hands in surrender. She giggled and remarked, I'm watching you, aren't you afraid of me? I replied, No. I'm Hilda Marks, and you must be Ted Miller. I'm going to pop in the shower and have a coffee. She pointed to the store across the street. I'll meet you there in 10 minutes, maybe 15. After all, I'm a woman. Our conversation was pleasant. She said that she had recently arrived in the area. She was 36 years old. She had a school-age son, but no husband. She left him on the West Coast. We talked for almost two hours, delving into all aspects of my life including my medical history. By the time the store closed, she knew everything about me. I was fascinated by her interest. At that time, I lived in a bungalow next to the gym with two bedrooms. It took two weeks before she finally visited my bed and stayed the night. She was as wild in bed as she was in the gym, but I was determined to dominate. Her desire to be conquered turned me on incredibly. Hilda's son, Donald, was 16 years old, and he was in the penultimate year of school. 
We became close because of our shared love of baseball, as we both practiced the sport. Over time I started helping the school team, which further strengthened our bond. Six months later, Hilda and I tied the knot because she was expecting a baby. The decision was made suddenly. Donald and Hilda moved into a house that I bought next to my own, where Donald had his own room and a place in the basement for sports equipment. This allowed Hilda to continue playing sports. Thomas Timothy Miller was born soon after, and to me he was nothing short of a miracle. Mel and Rob quickly became a thing of the past, as she changed agencies and started dating a young guy who was clearly doing something illegal. As a result, after a while, Mel was detained by the police and a large number of prohibited substances. Glenda married her college sweetheart James Wilder, and Hilda and I had a little chat with them. James turned out to be a nice guy, and Glenda, as always, looked great. I suppose she still has a certain appeal in bed. James and I discussed this issue once, and this moment brought us closer together. I still haven't completely forgiven my mother, but I visited her. When Thomas was born, she was overjoyed. Hilda made sure that my mother visited him regularly, showing him more sympathy than I did. My mother passed away in June of this year. The memorial service was held calmly, despite the difficult family life. Rob said goodbye to her, but I couldn't bring myself to do the same. After that, he kept his distance from me. Imagine, a rich but incompetent young man breaks into your house, into your shelter, and demands to take your wife away for a few nights. How would you react to such audacity? As if this is not enough, he begins to intimidate, causing a desire to engage in a physical fight with her and teach her a lesson. But instead of succumbing to temptation, I decided to act differently. When I finished loading the tools into my pickup truck that Thursday afternoon, my mood was far from joyful. The client I've been working with for the last couple of weeks didn't seem to be confident about the ladder design. His frequent requests to make changes to the original plan became annoying, and the last change he asked for that morning was so significant that it required me to dismantle a significant part of the work already done. In addition, I had to meet with the architect and engineer to take into account the client's new wish, which meant that we would have to revise the structural plans. As a result, the next day suddenly turned into a day off. My name is Kenneth Morrison. I am a leading artist and owner of a small carpentry workshop that specializes in creating first-class stairs. I work with elite clients such as wealthy homeowners, hotels, restaurants, and offices who are willing to pay over $50,000 for a custom-made art staircase. At the age of 34, I had been married for four years to 29-year-old Daphne Tupper. Daphne was a successful lawyer at the prestigious law firm Kramer, Boylan & Hendricks, which specialized in commercial law and intellectual property law. We haven't had any children yet. Daphne's priority was her career, not anything else. Arriving home at 4.30 p.m., I was stunned to find that my wife's car was parked at the entrance. It was unusual for her to return home early on a Thursday, as she usually worked late, finishing early only on Fridays. When I entered the house through the back door, as usual after a day at work at the construction site, I noticed a small problem with the water pressure. The idea that Daphne was in the shower upstairs at that time was strange, because she usually took a shower either in the morning or before going to bed. After quickly changing into comfortable clothes, I went upstairs to find out why my wife returned home unusually early on Thursday afternoon. As I expected, Daphne had just finished taking a shower and was now wearing revealing black fishnet stockings. A new black dress lay on the bed, ready to be put on. Hi honey, why are you home so early? Did I forget something? Do we have plans for the evening that I don't remember? I asked. She looked at me with an unexpected expression on her face, which, despite her attempts to hide it, indicated nervousness. Taking a deep breath, she replied, No, Kenneth, you haven't forgotten anything. I have plans for the evening and you're not invited. I'll be gone until Sunday afternoon. I'll spend the weekend with Derek Kramer. Confused, I asked, what? What do you mean? 
is this a work trip? She shook her head and replied, No, Kenneth, this is not a work trip. Derek has booked a hotel room for the two of us. I won't be here this weekend as the room is booked, she said, her tone resolute despite the rehearsed words. No, that's not going to happen. I can't let my wife spend the weekend with another man, I objected. Well, you better get used to it, Kenneth, because that's what Derek wants. And I advise you not to test it, she warned with a smirk. So you're volunteering for this plan? Do you expect me to just accept this, bury my feelings and let you leave and then come back as a faithful wife? I replied with sarcasm in my words. I never said it was a temporary agreement. Derek has made it clear that he wants this to be on a permanent basis. So yeah, suck it up and don't fuss. Trust me, your life will be easier if you just accept it, she said firmly. We'll see about that. I won't stand for this, Daphne. You have to think about the consequences of your actions. I will not let this vain man dictate my life. If you think that I am easily influenced, then you are mistaken. You're in for a surprise, I warned. She had already finished preparing for the evening when I went downstairs, took a beer out of the refrigerator, and saw a Mercedes approaching the house. The arrogant man himself, Derek, got out of the car, went to the front door and rang the bell. Kenneth, could you open the door for Derek? I quickly dialed the code on the tailgate alarm, set up the phone to record video, and put it in my t-shirt pocket. Then I settled down in the living room, getting ready to watch. My acquaintance with Derek Kramer began when Daphne joined CBH three years earlier. Our first meeting took place at the company's Christmas celebration. Derek, a man in his 40s, gave the impression of authority. He was cordial with colleagues, flirted with female employees, and was charming with his colleagues' wives. Of his male employees and the husbands of female employees watched his behavior, which radiated arrogance and contempt, causing instant dislike for this man. Daphne angrily descended the stairs and opened the door, and I watched from the living room, sipping a beer. Sorry for the delay, Derek. I don't know where my husband's manners have gone, she said, adopting a submissive tone. She whispered something to Derek, but I couldn't make out the words from where I was sitting. Hey man, I heard that you don't agree with Daphne spending the weekend with me, he growled as he entered the living room, looking like a school principal scolding a student. I was shocked by his arrogance, thinking that he could act like a boss in my own house. Get out of my house before I call the police, I said, clenching my fists in anger. He laughed, and Daphne grinned next to him. And what do you think the cops will do? He chuckled mockingly. Nothing. They won't do anything. Do you know why? Suddenly he noticed my mobile phone and tried to stop recording, but it was locked with a password. He threw it on the ceramic floor, where the ceramics emerged victorious from the collision. Listen up, smartass. Your wife is going to spend this weekend with me no matter how you feel about it. She will be with me whenever I want and your thoughts about it don't matter at all. Do you understand? If you try to interfere, there will be consequences. Your life will be a nightmare compared to what lies ahead. So this weekend, be quiet and don't cause any problems. If I hear that you upset Daphne, mentioned a divorce, or did something stupid like trying to contact my wife, I will not hesitate to disclose your suspicious money laundering activities or illegal content allegedly on your computer. I chose to pretend that I didn't know anything about it. The probability that this information will become public is very low. I have never been involved in money laundering and had nothing to do with illegal materials, I replied mechanically. This can be done without difficulty. Transferring files to a computer is a simple process. I have information that can quickly ruin your reputation. I pretended I didn't know anything. Possession of illegal materials involving minors is prohibited by law. If you download them to my computer, doesn't that mean you already have illegal content? Innocently asking. That's the difference between us. Actions that are forbidden to you are perfectly acceptable to people with powerful connections like me. I strongly recommend that you continue to behave like a working class person and not bother people with a higher status. Do you understand? 
I was shocked by the words I had just heard. Such a conversation would have been considered outrageous even in a fictional comedy, but this man was serious in my presence. Besides, I urge you to refrain from taking revenge on me or Daphne. I don't want to risk the infection passing from you to Daphne and then to me. I'm not going to ask Daphne to stop making love to you, at least not yet. Can't you see that I'm just trying to be reasonable? If you cross the line, I'll know about it, okay? Now let's go, honey. They headed for the front door. Daphne grabbed her bag and left without saying a word goodbye or looking in my direction. The fact that he called my wife honey made the situation surreal. Instead of pure anger, I felt a mixture of anger and disbelief. At that moment, I was silently thanking the robber who broke into my house a year before I met Daphne and forced me to install a thorough surveillance and alarm system. I installed motion-responsive cameras and voice-responsive microphones throughout the house, capable of recording everything that happens and storing it in the cloud. I never told Daphne that the system could be put into recording mode while we were at home, so she was left in the dark when I activated it right before she opened the front door to this unfortunate man. At the same time, I turned on the recording on my mobile phone, using it as bait. I was hoping that Kramer would notice the camera and find a way to turn it off, which would allow him to speak more openly without suspecting that he was being recorded. It seemed to me that this could provide valuable information for a possible divorce. The phone that fell to the floor was my work cell phone. Working with wealthier clients, I soon realized that giving them my personal phone means being available around the clock. Having a separate work phone allowed me to disconnect at the end of the day and reply to messages the next morning. At least I still had a way to communicate. I took my personal phone and dialed the number of my business lawyer and close friend Harry. Harry married my older sister Jennifer 10 years ago. Their marriage was filled with happiness until tragedy struck. After four years of marital bliss, Jennifer tragically drowned during a trip with friends to Guadalupe. Despite his bereavement, Harry continued to be a beloved member of our family, earning our affection and admiration. Three years later, Harry found love again with Kristen. After a year of dating, they exchanged vows, and my parents Daphne and I were the guests of honor at their wedding. To this day, Harry and Christina are like family to me. When I found myself in a difficult situation, I turned to Harry for help. I told him about the threats from a certain Kramer and what happened during my wife's weekend trip. Without hesitation, Harry offered his help. He advised me not to leave the house, not to contact anyone and to turn off all means of communication. Harry assured me that he and Christina would arrive with dinner in just an hour, and this gave me a much-needed sense of confidence. As I recalled the events of the last hour, it became clear to me that my wife, Daphne, was fascinated by Kramer's strength and charisma. I never thought that she would prefer him to our love. It was a painful realization that our bond was not as strong as I had thought before. Five years ago, my relationship with Daphne began at a mutual friend's birthday party. Despite the fact that I didn't know many people at the party, I struck up a conversation with Daphne, who turned out to be the sister of an army friend of the birthday boy who served in Afghanistan. Our bond grew stronger and stronger, as a result of which we started dating a week later, and the following year we tied the knot. All this time, I continued to work for Mr. Duncan, the founder of the small company I worked for. Craig Duncan was a well-known woodworking specialist in our area, but his accounting and management skills left much to be desired. When I was in college, he hired me as a part-time accountant to help him keep the books. As the workload increased, Mr. Duncan entered into three major contracts that required more attention than he could give. Despite the difficulties, the clients insisted that he take on these projects. As a result, he asked me to help him with his work. At first I ran errands, delivered goods, and helped move large items. It quickly turned out that I was a fast learner and well-suited for this job. After overcoming the initial difficulties, I was able to independently complete simpler tasks or make an effective contribution to more complex projects. 
Although I graduated from the university with a degree in accounting, my love of practical work forced me to do an internship. After receiving the certificate and becoming Mr. Duncan's assistant, I was able to buy out his share in the business with the financial support of my parents. Despite the underestimation on the part of CBH's lawyers, who saw me as a simple store employee, I persisted. My company has thrived by focusing on fewer but more profitable projects. A few months earlier, I had hired two assistants, and my income and expenses exceeded those of many lawyers in my wife's entourage. Despite my successes, even my wife did not know about these achievements. I was brought back to reality by Kristen and Harry, who came with Chinese food and beer. Kristen hugged me comfortingly and asked, I can't believe Daphne would do this to you. It's so out of character for her. After Harry hugged me encouragingly, he said, Don't worry, we'll figure it out together. Let's have dinner, and then I'll check your file. I told him about Daphne's unfriendly attitude when I got home after lunch. After we ate, I took out my laptop and found files with recordings from the camera and microphone. Fortunately, the conversations were very clear. I can't believe what I just heard, Harry exclaimed. Pretty arrogant guy, huh? I remarked. No, more like downright stupid, Harry replied. Is this guy 40 or 42 years old? This means that he has about 15 years of legal practice under his belt. He's not a beginner. And at the same time, he is so self-sufficient that it does not occur to him that sometimes you just need to be silent. Your clever tactic of pretending he's not being recorded after he smashed your phone has been successful. He bought into it and revealed all the information we needed. I asked if it was legal to use the recording because it was made without his consent. Absolutely, Harry assured me. This is your home. You have the right to record anything you want here. So I have nothing to worry about. Is that what you mean? No, that's not what I'm talking about. We need to proceed with caution. I made some inquiries on the way here. Christina was generous enough to get behind the wheel and pick up the food. It turned out that our target, Kramer, is the son of the founder of the law firm. Did you already know about this? Harry asked, and I confirmed it. Perhaps you don't know that his father, Marvin Kramer, has a good reputation. He wasn't a great lawyer. But most of the judges in this region were his old college friends, which gave him a significant advantage in winning cases. Now this has become a problem, as his son Derek has decided to pursue the same career. With his extensive connections with friendly judges, it will be incredibly difficult to get a positive decision in our favor, regardless of the legality of his actions. This poses a serious threat to our legal battles. So you're saying that I'm going to find myself in a difficult situation no matter what? That's not quite true. It will be difficult to win, but it is possible. Besides, I have powerful connections. The main thing is to collect enough evidence to build a reliable case against him. I have a strategy. But what about the judges who always support him? I asked. If we don't take the case to the criminal court, that's exactly what we're going to do. Our conversation was interrupted by a knock on the front door. A short brunette was standing on the porch. Hello, Mr. Morrison, she greeted. Hi, Laura. Come in, Harry greeted her. Kenneth, this is Laura Foster. She's a computer expert from the private detective agency we work with. I contacted her after our phone conversation today. We brought Laura up to date and asked her to listen to the recording of the conversation, especially the part where Kramer mentions downloading evidence to my computer. Laura listened to him carefully, and then outlined the plan in detail. In either of the two possible scenarios, they will come in the afternoon, perhaps with the help of your wife, hack into your computer, change the date and upload their materials so that it seems that it was done before Kramer's visit. If this happens, your camera system will record everything. Before you go to work in the morning, don't forget to put your device into recording mode. She took out a small gray box from her bag. Another option is to give them remote access to your computer for possible atrocities. I will install this module in front of your modem to keep track of everyone who is trying to access your router 
and see what they are trying to upload or download. Take the time to transfer all personal or confidential information and files to a USB drive, and then erase everything on your computer. Laura confidently explained that she would help prevent access to data by ensuring that no hidden information would remain on the computer. It was obvious that she was well-versed in her field. Harry added, Let's get started. Kenneth, the only evidence you have against him for blackmail is the tape. If you try to bring a case based solely on her, your case can be quickly closed. Blackmail is usually not considered by the public as a serious crime, and judges whom a person knows may be inclined to support it. The ideal situation would be if Kramer planted illegal material on your computer and then reported it to the police, providing false evidence that you possess illegal content. Thus, a trace will be found indicating that these actions took place without your participation at the computer. Thanks to the warning we received from Kramer, which we will definitely document, we will have the necessary evidence to put forward strong arguments against him in court. If he becomes involved in criminal activities, especially those related to illegal materials, his judicial friends are unlikely to support him and are likely to distance themselves from him. I find it disturbing and abnormal, I remarked. Yes, but Kramer is still vicious. And here's another thing. Could you not use the computer for the next few days? If Kramer carries out his plan and denounces you, the police may want to check computer records to find out if anyone accessed illegal files after downloading them. Without using a computer, we will be able to keep the records clean, which will be beneficial for us. Also, make sure your mobile phone doesn't connect to your home Wi-Fi in the coming days so they can't use your phone instead of a computer. After installing the surveillance module and deleting all confidential information from my devices, Laura assured us that the module would send us copies of any access requests. As soon as we have information, I will contact Harry and you. Good luck, guys, Laura said before leaving. Let's focus on more practical matters, Harry suggested. Kenneth, do you want to start the divorce process right now? Or do you want to wait until Daphne gets back and try to sort things out? No, I want to get divorced as soon as possible. I can't stay married to a woman who is easily influenced by self-proclaimed strong personalities. I'm confident in this decision. Okay, I'll contact Claudia Milton tomorrow. She is a family law specialist at my job and is known for her fairness and efficiency. I'll ask her to contact you as soon as possible. I think you'll enjoy working with her. Harry reassured me while we continued the conversation. I gave him access to my recording system so that he could receive real-time updates and save information to the cloud. Christina and Harry left around 11 p.m., and I took sedatives to fall asleep quickly. The next day at 8.30 a.m., Claudia Milton called me after talking to Harry about my situation. She asked me to come to her office at 11 a.m., during our meeting, Claudia showed sympathy for my situation after learning about Derek Kramer's dubious reputation. She reassured me by explaining that since I bought the house before I met Daphne, and her name was not on the deed, the property still belongs to me. Since we don't have children, the divorce process will be simple. Worried about my business, I asked if I would have to sell it and split the profits. Claudia called Harry to discuss my concerns and he quickly calmed us both down. The prenuptial agreement clearly states that your company belongs only to you, and she has no rights to it. Despite their possible attempts, I have thoroughly checked and confirmed that they have no legitimate grounds for further action. After meeting with Claudia at 12.30 p.m., I discussed financial issues with her. She assured me that everything was being handled efficiently and informed me that Daphne would receive the divorce papers at her office on Monday. After replacing my damaged mobile phone, I spent the rest of the weekend working in the yard and watching my favorite TV shows. Even though I still held a grudge against Daphne, I couldn't accept that it was true. Although I knew that I would eventually have to mourn the end of our marriage, at that moment my emotions were still too raw. The thought of Daphne coming home on Sunday haunted me, and I agonized over whether I should sleep in the guest room or force her to stay there. Eventually I realized that this was my house and that she had abandoned me. I decided not to share a bed with her and moved all her things to the guest room. 
Then I bought a new door handle with a lock for the bedroom door, and I kept the key in my pocket. The next evening, when I heard the asshole's car pull up, I turned on the surveillance system for recording. I saw Daphne kiss her boss for a long time and then get out of the car and wave goodbye to him as he drove away. I was sitting in the living room, seemingly deep in concentration on a book, when she came in. Hi dear, how was your weekend? She asked, looking nervous. Although she tried to hide it, I could tell she wasn't as calm as she seemed. I decided not to answer her, continuing to focus my attention on the book. Okay, keep sulking. Derek was right when he said you'd act like that, she muttered implying that you may not have the intelligence to understand my demands or the emotional maturity to admit your shortcomings. She headed up the stairs. When she left, I started counting. One, two, three. Kenneth Morrison, what's going on? Did you put a lock on our bedroom? Correction, my bedroom, I replied calmly. Your things have been moved to the guest bedroom. You will live there until you find a new apartment. What the hell is this? Derek should know about this. It wasn't part of our deal. What kind of deal? I didn't agree to any of your partner's ridiculous demands. Either you stay in the guest room or you clean up. Maybe Kramer's wife will take you to her bed. She looked at me in silence, stormed into the guest room and slammed the door. I followed her upstairs, shouting through the door. And if we're talking about deals, what's in it for me? When I didn't get an answer... I decided to go back upstairs. About 15 minutes later, my phone buzzed with messages from an unknown number. The messages were demanding, saying, Hey, why don't you let Daphne into her own room? Asshole, I think I've explained everything clearly. I won't pay attention to your child crisis. Cook Daphne her favorite dinner and apologize. If you behave yourself for the rest of the week, then I will allow Daphne to be intimate with you next weekend. If you don't listen, you will see that my warnings are not empty threats. Follow my instructions implicitly, do you understand? I was shocked by the words I read. It seemed that this man lacked empathy. He was disconnected from reality and stupid. I decided not to answer, but took a screenshot of the conversation and sent it to Harry. Harry replied three minutes later commenting, Unbelievable, this man really thinks highly of himself. But he's just a first-class idiot. Let's not waste time answering him. Kramer sent several more requests for recognition, but I chose not to respond. Eventually, he stopped contacting me. I didn't see Daphne again that evening. I went to bed with the door locked and the recording system on. I sent a text message to one of my assistants saying that I would be late the next day. I waited until morning. After Daphne left, I took my time getting ready for the day. I decided to cook myself breakfast while transferring the recordings I had made the night before to the system. It was late in the morning when Daphne finally emerged from the guest room. She had already showered in the guest bathroom and left without breakfast. To my surprise, she didn't try to do anything with my computer, which I was very worried about. At that moment, a message from Claudia Milton appeared on my phone. It read, Hello Kenneth. I informed Harry that the divorce papers would be served at 10.15 a.m. today. Before heading to the store, I checked again that my home security system was still recording and set to alert if triggered. I had an appointment with the architect at 11 a.m. to finalize the changes for the client. I took care of small things until it was time for the meeting. I expected a call from Daphne shortly after she received it, but it never came. At 10.45 a.m., I texted Harry, sharing my surprise at Daphne's silence. This must mean that she discussed the divorce papers with Kramer. Perhaps they are already planning something. I'll contact Laura. Harry replied, keep me informed. Surprisingly, the meeting went well, which allowed me not to be distracted. After I spent the rest of the day collecting tools and tidying up the store, at 3.12 p.m. I received a signal on my mobile phone. I quickly sent Harry a message to let him know that the show had started. He replied with a thumbs up. Then I logged in and watched the events unfold in my house. Daphne and an unknown man entered our home office, where they turned on my computer. They exchanged only a few words. A few minutes after decrypting my password, 
the man inserted a USB flash drive into the computer and within about 10 minutes began to engage in suspicious activity. Fortunately, I was able to take clear pictures of his face. At this time, Daphne went to the guest room and packed her things in trash bags, as her suitcases were in the closet in the master bedroom. After finishing his business, the man turned off the computer and told Daphne that he was leaving. When she finished packing, she left the room at 3.56 p.m. Shortly after the recording stopped, Harry contacted me. Okay, Kenneth, go home and act natural, he said. I think they might involve the police today or tomorrow, so be ready for the inspector's visit. It takes several hours to get a search warrant, so expect them tomorrow. Worried, I asked. Is it possible? I have already contacted Stephen Lindsay, a trusted criminal defense attorney, and shared all the necessary information, including recordings. Harry assured me that it would be the easiest thing of the year. I also gave Harry a code to access my alarm system records in case of arrest. After further discussion, we ended our conversation. As I drove home, I felt incredibly anxious. Fortunately, the evening passed without police visits, calls from Daphne and unpleasant messages from Kramer. I made myself a sandwich and enjoyed eating it while watching TV. Despite the fact that I really wanted to tell my parents about what was happening, I decided to wait until the storm subsided. Trying to explain to my mother what computer hacking and cloud video storage are seemed like a pointless activity that would only cause unnecessary worries. The next day, while I was shopping, I received another notice of an invasion of my home. Like last time, I quickly texted Harry and checked my security system after the incident. The police entered my house and tried to turn off the alarm. It looks like they succeeded because the connection was lost. Harry told me that he had seen everything and sent the photos to Stephen Lindsay. About an hour later, two policemen showed up at the store and arrested me. I was handcuffed and taken in a police car. They quickly explained my rights to me and began to interrogate me, but I chose not to answer. When we arrived at the police station, my phone and wallet were taken from me, and then they put me in a cell with five other people. The room was quiet. Everyone avoided eye contact and looked at the tiled floor. Three hours later, a security guard appeared to take me to the meeting room, where I was supposed to meet with my lawyer. Confused, I asked the guard how they knew who my lawyer was, but they didn't say anything and left me alone in the room. Ten minutes later, the door opened again, and Derek Kramer entered the room with a confident smile. He sat down opposite me but we sat in silence, maintaining eye contact and not saying a word. Having established his superiority and declared himself the winner in the confrontation, he looked at me with a smug look and said, have you finally realized the gravity of the situation? I was silent. I asked you a question, Morrison. Speak up, you worthless idiot. I decided not to answer anymore. It will be your word against mine, Morrison, he warned. The opinion of the carpenter will be opposed to the opinion of one of the most famous lawyers in the city. Do you want to predict the result? He asked with a grin. Standing up, he continued, it looks like you need time to think about what I've told you. Let's meet tomorrow morning and talk further. Perhaps a night in this shared cell with your companions will help you clarify the situation, he remarked before leaving the room. I was taken back to the cell, where there were now only four people. In the afternoon, another visitor came to me. I was taken to the same meeting room, where a tall, blonde man with a serious expression was waiting for me. He stood up when I entered and introduced himself as Stephen Lindsay. He mentioned that Harry had contacted him earlier in the day after he couldn't get through to me. Under such circumstances, we had a feeling that you could have been arrested and taken to this place. I listed all the events that happened during the day, even mentioning the disturbing visit of Derek Kramer. Stephen's jaw dropped in shock, but he didn't say anything. So... You have a court hearing scheduled for tomorrow morning. There will most likely be a large bail amount, but Harry will take care of it. I know it's going to be a difficult night, but try to hold on. Both Harry and I are here to support you. In the meantime, continue stubbornly refusing to answer their questions. 
I have officially taken over your case and will make sure that Kramer does not bother you anymore. The next day, I appeared before a judge on charges of possession of prohibited materials, maintaining a statement of my innocence. Bail was set at 25,000, and I was released the same day. I was forbidden to leave the city and contact my future ex-wife, Derek Kramer, or anyone from their office. Despite this, I was allowed to work in my store. Stephen returned my cell phone and wallet to me, and we went to a late lunch, where our conversation continued. Yesterday at the police station, I refrained from unnecessary information for privacy reasons. But after making a few calls and making inquiries, I found out quite a lot of intriguing information about Derek Kramer. Now I'm going to offer you some comforting information. To begin with, it takes several hours to obtain a search warrant, and only after that can the authorities examine the evidence found and issue an arrest warrant. In your situation, you were taken away before the search of your house was completed. Besides, despite the restrictions on communicating with me or Harry, Derek Kramer was allowed to visit you. These circumstances strongly suggest that the whole situation was planned, which is certainly contrary to the law. Harry mentioned that Kramer has influence over many judges, I said. Not at all, he replied slyly. You can't maintain so many connections without making enemies. I'm not sure what I'll find at home. I pray that my wife and her treacherous accomplice don't take everything. Don't worry about it. Harry went to your house right after the police left. After reactivating the system and restarting the recording, no one was in sight. I decided to go back to the store and pick up the car, and then go home to take a much-needed shower. When I returned, I received a message from the architect confirming that the updated plan had been approved by the client, which was good because it meant that I could focus on work the next day. But when I arrived home, I was greeted by chaos. Every corner of the house was thoroughly searched. After setting up the damaged computer, I was sure that I would not find anything suspicious. When I was putting things in order, tears welled up in my eyes for the first time. Just a week ago, I was happy in what I thought was a strong marriage. Now I find myself accused of a crime, on the verge of divorce, and under the influence of my wife's manipulative boss. I couldn't help but wonder what I had done to deserve this. Fortunately, the press did not pursue me. Most likely they were too focused on the recently uncovered multi-billion dollar scandal to pay attention to someone like me. At the end of the following week, Stephen contacted me and told me the important news. I was relieved to learn that all charges against me have been dropped. It seems that the inspector assigned to my case was not easily influenced, especially when it came to blackmail. Despite Kramer's attempts to manipulate the situation, the inspector remained adamant. Wasting no time, the inspector ensured that Derek Kramer was charged with blackmail, fabrication of evidence and possession of prohibited materials involving children. Daphne was involved in a conspiracy related to these crimes. After talking to Stephen, Harry called me and invited me to dinner that evening. On the way to Harry's, I was contacted by my family law lawyer, Claudia Milton. Kenneth, the lawyer representing Daphne contacted me today and informed me that she is ready to sign the divorce papers in their current form, but she asked for an hour-long face-to-face meeting with you before completing the process. The meeting can take place in his office. Despite my reluctance to see Daphne, I understood that this meeting could speed up the divorce process, so I agreed. I instructed Claudia to arrange a meeting, accepting Daphne's condition. The evening I spent with Harry and Kristen was a much-needed respite, and for the first time in two weeks, I felt really relaxed. Kristen cooked a delicious dinner of coconut shrimp and rice, and when I returned home, I felt satisfied. Despite the upcoming meeting with Daphne on Wednesday, at which I became a victim of delusion, I could not get rid of my nervousness. When I arrived, Claudia directed me to her office, where she gave me advice. I'm not sure of her motives, but I think it's necessary to warn you. A criminal case has been opened against her. Please be careful not to give her any information that could be used against you in court. Since we can't check her for recording devices, keep in mind that she can record your conversation. 
Thanks for the warning, I replied. Then I was taken to a small private meeting room, where Daphne was already waiting. I expected to meet the same angry and arrogant Daphne that I had encountered in the previous weeks. But Daphne, standing in front of me, seemed broken and vulnerable. Despite the fact that I felt a surge of compassion, the memories of her questionable behavior with Kramer quickly negated all the positive feelings that I could feel. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me, Kenneth, she said. What can you tell me, Daphne? After everything that happened, I replied. Tears streamed down her face as she spoke. Kenneth, I am overwhelmed with shame for the way I treated you. You're such a wonderful husband, and you don't deserve the pain I've caused. I was blinded by Derek Kramer's manipulations. But when I found out that the charges against you were dropped, and that he and I could face the consequences, it knocked me out of my rut. I can't look at myself in the mirror and all because of a stupid mistake. She continued to reflect on herself, spontaneously analyzing her own behavior. She didn't ask me for any information, and didn't ask me anything. Kenneth, I understand that our relationship has come to an end. If I were you, I'd like to get a divorce too. I don't hold it against you for ending the relationship. I want you to know that I quit my job. I told Derek Kramer that I don't want to talk to him anymore. I went back to my parents' house and told them everything. They are very angry with me. There is a tense and unwelcoming atmosphere at home. I stared at her in silence. There was no smart way out of the situation. She brought this on herself, and now she has to deal with the consequences. The coming months, maybe even years, will be difficult for me, Kenneth. I do not know what the future holds for me. The only thing I want is that one day, when everything calms down, we will have the opportunity to become friends. It seems like a distant possibility, Daphne. Very distant. We'll have to wait and see. I wished her luck before getting up and leaving the room. Some part of me still cared about her, but reconciliation was impossible. Even if I wanted revenge, circumstances had already made her an unhappy person. Having learned her lesson, Daphne decided not to seek retribution anymore. She cooperated with the authorities by making a plea deal for Derek Kramer, which eventually led to her moving to another city. Unfortunately, I lost touch with her after that. When the accusations of blackmail of Kramer surfaced, two more people filed a complaint against him. As a result, Kramer was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Since the police had recordings of all my conversations with him, my testimony was not necessary. After Kramer was convicted, I filed a civil lawsuit against him and what was left of his firm, and eventually achieved a settlement in the amount of $2 million, most of which went to Harry. Despite the fact that I pretended to be outraged, I was glad to compensate Harry for his invaluable help. My business is booming now. I am currently in the process of finalizing a deal to acquire a specialized door manufacturer, which will improve our operations. With a team of six employees who feel like family, I'm happy with how things are going. After the divorce, Harry and Kristen invited me to a barbecue party, where I met Kristen's younger sister, Katie. We immediately found a common language and have been dating for several weeks. I'm looking forward to where this relationship will take us. A few weeks after the conclusion of the civil case against CBH and Kramer, I visited Kramer in prison. I made sure that the guard stayed to watch our conversation and grinned slyly when Kramer entered the room. Teasing him as he sat down, he asked, What do you want, you bastard? When Kramer saw me, he tried to leave, but the guard insisted that he stay and listen. Brushing aside his insults, I said dispassionately, To launch a preemptive strike? How intriguing. I found out that your wife, Jessica, has filed for divorce, and I thought about inviting her to dinner to give her a special evening. Kramer, in a rage, called me a scoundrel, but I interrupted him with a smirk. I told him not to waste his breath as I had already asked Jessica out on a date. I mentioned her hummingbird tattoo on her thigh making Kramer blush with anger. He was about to threaten me but then he realized that it wouldn't help him. But I'm not going to talk about Jessica today. I just wanted to tell you that you're being stupid and sometimes you need to be reminded of your own stupidity. 
Think about it. Threatening a man in his own home and imposing consequences on him for not fulfilling your unreasonable demands is not a sign of intelligence, is it? Even an experienced carpenter will be able to determine this. Let's put it this way. In this case, you will remain in the dust. I couldn't help laughing when he got excited. Didn't you say that some things are unacceptable to people like me, but quite acceptable to people in your position? Your influence is truly amazing. I bow before your greatness. Maybe it's because of the jumpsuit that you have such strength? It suits you very well, I said, feeling his anger become palpable, as if he was about to have a neurological breakdown. Finally, I laughed and reminded him of his beautiful wife with whom I want to have a great time. I struck back, and it calmed me down. When the evening came to an end, my wife and I waved goodbye to the last guest from the porch, wishing him a Merry Christmas. Hosting holiday parties for our neighbors has become a tradition for Amy and me. What originally started with just four pairs has grown steadily over the years. This year we were happy to invite more than 35 people, and about a third of them did not even live in our area. The increase in the number of guests was most likely due to the festive atmosphere created by a lot of alcohol and slightly naughty games, which became a favorite part of our meetings. Every year the games became more daring, but they never crossed the boundaries of what was allowed. Like Amy and me, most of the participants were between the ages of 25 and 35. Many of them were parents of several children. It was not the wild and reckless crowd that we had in our student days. On the contrary, they were responsible, purposeful young parents who wanted to relax at least one evening a year. The neighborhood women always brought a lot of food, much more than the participants could eat, and my husband and I provided an abundant supply of alcohol. When several neighbors started bringing friends from other areas, it didn't cause much concern. My wife, without warning me, invited several of her colleagues to the party, including her close friend and colleague Ron Stevens from their company's external sales department, with whom she has worked closely for the past five years. They seem to spend a lot of time together, especially considering the frequency of their trips and participation in sales conferences. Just a few days before the party, he became the subject of heated discussions in our family. His presence at the party prevented me from having fun. I took it upon myself to help Amy with the cleaning and garbage collection, and when I returned, she was almost finished in the kitchen. It's time to talk to her. Why did you decide to invite Ron and your colleagues to our neighborhood party? I like their company, so I thought it would be great if they came. I think they had a good time and fit in well with our company. What is the problem? Are you serious, Amy? You know how I feel about your relationship with him and you invited him to our house? This is our home, Mark. I can invite anyone I want to our party. I don't need your approval. Do you think it's appropriate to humiliate me by exposing your boyfriend in my house in front of our friends and colleagues? I noticed the smirks and raised eyebrows of your colleagues. What's going on? I've told you many times that Ron is not my boyfriend. No one mocked you. It's just your groundless jealousy which is already pretty boring. Did you really think that no one noticed you sneaking upstairs with him? What are you up to, Amy? Why did you need to be alone with Mr. Wonderful? I'm sorry, but we didn't go upstairs. He just needed to go to the bathroom and downstairs was busy. I quickly showed him the guest bathroom. I was there for no more than a minute or two. Your accusations are groundless. You disappeared for more than 30 minutes. I saw Hale trying to distract me and she was keeping track of the time. You're being paranoid. Gail's attempts at friendliness were obvious, although it was unclear why she was trying so hard to help. I noticed how she remained silent in response to the accusation of lying, which indicated that her negotiation skills were better than her ability to deceive me. Amy's unexpected invitation to her lover was the ultimate betrayal that made me decide that I would no longer tolerate dishonesty and lack of respect. While she continued to pour insults and lies, I turned around and went up the stairs. I went into the bathroom to collect my toiletries and accidentally dropped the deodorant. When I bent down to pick it up, I noticed a gold foil wrapper in the trash. My heart started pounding, and I realized that it was a contraceptive package. 
After the birth of my second child, I had a vasectomy, so I knew it wasn't mine. This confirmed my suspicions that my wife was cheating on me. Amy burst through the bathroom door, hurling insults and accusing me of being paranoid. I insisted, slowly turning to face her and holding the foil in my hands. This is not paranoia, but the real truth, I insisted. Maybe someone planted this as a joke. I didn't do anything wrong. Amy kept blaming me, but I insisted. I've had enough, Amy. It's over, I said. I couldn't forgive that. This is not what I wanted. I understand that you didn't expect me to find evidence of your deception. It was your big mistake. Let me explain what happened. Everything seems to be very clear. You ran away from the party and got intimate with your lover while I was downstairs with our friends. Did it fascinate you? Sleeping with him in our house while I was downstairs? No, it wasn't like that. Please, dear, let me explain everything. This is not how I imagined our party. I quickly put the foil in my pocket when Amy stepped aside to avoid me. I could hear her begging me as I made my way past her into the guest bedroom. With a quick movement, I slammed the door and locked it, ignoring Amy's desperate pleas. Just in case, I dragged a chest of drawers to the door, knowing that she probably didn't know how to pick the lock. Amy's screams demanding an explanation were muffled, as I firmly insisted on my own, not wanting to open the door. There was more and more knocking on the door, asking me to open the door, but I didn't want to open it, turned on the TV, and turned up the volume. It seemed impossible to fall asleep, and I mentally listed all the cases when I stayed late, went on trips and attended conferences. Did she like talking to Ron in those moments? Was she with him? The thought was unbearable, but it felt like a harsh reality. A tear rolled down her cheek, and her stomach clenched at the thought of having to tell her daughters about her parents' separation. How could she betray our children like that? How could she only think of herself? What made her prefer another man to our family? Am I not good enough as a husband? Why is this happening to us? Endless questions, overwhelming doubts, heartache, anger. It all consumed me. Sleep was slipping away, and the morning sun was mocking me, shining through the window. I reluctantly got out of bed, knowing that this Sunday morning would be busy. I pushed aside the chest of drawers and went out of the room into the hallway. The door was ajar, which allowed me to catch a glimpse of Amy lying on the bed. I closed the door and headed to the guest bathroom to freshen up. After getting dressed, I went to the kitchen to pour myself a cup of coffee. While I was carrying my drink to the table, Amy came into the room. Despite her disheveled appearance, swollen eyes, tousled hair, red nose and traces of a hangover, she still looked amazing. Another wave of pain overwhelmed me. How could this happen to us? I was perplexed, looking at her coffee cup standing next to the coffee pot. As always, I poured the perfect amount of skimmed milk into it. I didn't even realize I'd done it until she poured herself a cup and sat down at the table across from me. Mark, she began, her voice heavy with regret. I've ruined everything. I thought I was being so smart. I was hoping to teach a lesson, but now I see my mistake. I was stupid to try to shock you, but everything turned against me. I deeply regret my actions and apologize. You didn't deserve to be treated like this, and I understand that you're mad at me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to feel this anger. It was very nice of you to invite your boyfriend to our house without thinking about the situation. Dear, please let me start from the beginning. It's too late to explain your plans now. All our neighbors saw how you implemented your action plan last night. Amy hurried to my chair, turned me away from the table, sat on my lap and hugged me tightly. Please let me explain everything. Give me five minutes, Mark. I turned away from her, avoiding her attempt to kiss me on the cheek. Tears streamed down her face as she begged for forgiveness. Anger boiled up in me, but I resisted the urge to act. I couldn't bring myself to hurt her no matter how much she deserved it. I took a deep breath and pulled myself together. Okay, Amy, five minutes. Now please get off me. Five minutes. I refuse to back down. I can't risk you leaving before I tell you everything. I looked at the watch on my left wrist and realized how stupid I had been the night before, 
and all because of Ron and his stupid decisions. I raised an eyebrow. Okay, okay. You've made it clear that you don't trust him and therefore doubt my ability to handle him. Even if I swore I didn't have romantic feelings for him, you wouldn't believe me. You seem to think I was an innocent teenage girl who was easily convinced by the salesman, as if I'd ever fall for his banal phrases or any other guy's tricks. Of course, he tried to flirt with me like so many others. Even some of my clients tried to sweeten the deal by hitting on me. But let me make it clear that I am not naive. I am well aware of my appearance and that guys will always try to flirt with me. But I always stand my ground and say no. Naturally, I mastered the art of politely refusing with a smile so as not to hurt someone's ego. But my refusal was always decisive. Having withstood your persistent courtship as it seemed to me for the 40th or 50th time, I reached the limit and decided to demonstrate the stupidity of your behavior. With Ron and Gail's help, I came up with a plan. I knew you noticed me going upstairs with Ron. In fact, we had to wait until you finished filling your bowl with ice so that you would face the stairs when our plan was implemented. Gail made it clear that she would distract you when we went upstairs. Everything was going according to my plan. I brought Ron into our room and sat him down in a chair, waiting for you to come in. After a while, it became clear that you weren't going to come up to us to confront me. When I was intoxicated, I didn't realize how much pain I had caused you. I thought you'd just given up on me, and I burst into tears. Ron came up to me and hugged me tenderly while I was giving way to tears. His gentle touches on my back and hair gave me a feeling of comfort easing my pain. When I came to my senses, I tried to pull away, but he surprised me with a kiss. Caught off guard, I hesitated for a moment before pushing him away, interrupting an intimate moment. Disappointed, I demanded an explanation of his actions. Grinning, he slyly remarked that he knew that my initial approach was a ploy to bring him closer, and now that we were face to face, it was time to tell about our true intentions. I leaned forward, took off one shoe and threw it at him, hitting him in the chest. He recoiled and met my gaze, noticing my angry expression for the first time. Without saying a word, he quickly headed for the bathroom. It looks like he got rid of the contraceptives, flushed the toilet and threw the foil in the trash during his short retreat. I didn't expect such stupidity from him. I told Gail about his action and she immediately took matters into her own hands, punched him in the ears, and left. If necessary, I could easily contact her for confirmation. Watching her closely, she slowly got up, and grabbing me by the shoulders, sat down on my lap. Pushing her away, I picked up my cup and headed for the coffee maker. When I filled my cup, I sat down next to her. Mark, please talk to me. I understand that you're upset about what happened, but I want you to know that I didn't cheat. I shared with you the truth about the situation. I never wanted to be with him. Like many of us, he was a little drunk last night and made a mistake. Kissing and revelations were never part of my plans. He's stupid, and I don't need problems at work. But on Monday, Gail and I will make sure that he answers for his actions. Darling, I'm sorry. Will you ever be able to forgive me? I looked at her realizing that she had set up the situation so that I could see it. You expected me to get angry and burst into our bedroom to interrupt my unfaithful wife's intimacy with her boyfriend on my bed. And then when I walk into the room and see you two chatting innocently, I suppose you're going to mock and tease me for being a jealous partner. Of course, Gail was going to bring the rest of your colleagues up the stairs after me so that they could join in the ridicule of your two stupid jokes, right? Perhaps you wanted to make such a spectacle so that the rest of the party would quickly gather to watch what was happening, and my friends and neighbors could join in the laughter at the jealous fool. So that was your strategy? Did you think that by shaming me in front of everyone, you would prove once and for all that I should trust you and never doubt your loyalty? Well, I just wanted you to see the fallacy of your actions towards Ron. You're constantly drawing the wrong conclusions. I was so hurt that you thought that of me. I thought our party would prove the opposite to you, but when I started interfering with you two, it ruined your fun and made you so angry that you decided to punish me in a different way. 
Is that why you decided to teach me a lesson, show your superiority and put me in my place? Amy was shocked. What lesson are you talking about? What do you mean? You let Ron end up on my bed while I was downstairs pretending I didn't understand anything. It was probably a worthy revenge for the fact that I disrupted your plans. Oh my god, we're back to this again. You told your side of the story, but it wasn't the full truth, as you missed some details. I'm sure you and Gail spent a lot of time last night reworking a version that had at least a little bit of truth to make it seem plausible. I don't understand what you're trying to say. Mark, I've admitted that I was wrong. Let's forget about my stupid joke and end this argument. I disagree, I replied, taking a plastic bag out of my pocket. This was your way of getting back at me. This is the part of your story that you hid from me. It shows that I can't believe anything you've said. Amy examined the bag, trying to make out its contents. I picked her up, rocking her slightly in my arms. Amy narrowed her eyes. I couldn't help but smile at the shock on her face. Ron really was a complete idiot. He tied it up before flushing the water so that the air bubble would keep it afloat. I got up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and found him floating in the toilet tank. This jerk didn't even bother to check if he flushed the water, I replied. Oh my god! Amy stared at me with her mouth open. I'm really sorry. I'm sorry I lied to you. You're right. I was so angry when you didn't follow me. I was so drunk that I made the stupid decision to sleep with Ron, leaning over our bed without thinking. It seemed like a way to teach you a lesson, but looking back, I realize how stupid it was. Everything I did was stupid. My plan to teach you a lesson was to make love to Ron. I screwed up really badly. She lowered her head and began to cry. What does this mean for our relationship? Is this the end for us? Will I be able to withstand the consequences of one outburst of anger and frustration that led to my constant doubts? Doubts are a constant feeling that something is wrong. A few months ago I felt a change in Amy. But how and why? Why did I suspect that she was cheating on me with Ron? Why did she have to prove to me that Ron wasn't a threat? At least until anger and intoxication got the better of her last night. I was shocked that she considered a secret affair with Ron an appropriate form of payback for my mistake. This was not the woman I married. When intimacy had lost its meaning for her so much that she could use it as a punishment, I was upset by the thought that with the help of intimacy, you can achieve more than just love. Looking at her tears, I realized that she had become a skilled manipulator. Gail must have taught her the art of negotiation, honing all the skills to achieve her goals. Gail, an experienced sales manager who has always outperformed her male competitors, took young Amy under her wing as a mentor. Despite the fact that Gail was an aging, divorced woman, she showed Amy how to dominate negotiations with male clients. When Amy began to excel in her new leadership role, she realized that she had Gail to thank for her success. Gail's constant support and guidance have played an important role in shaping her career. The bonuses allowed us to start saving money for our children's college education and cover all our expenses. But what was the true price? It's time to find the answers. I applauded slowly saying, Bravo, bravo. It was a great show. Your quick thinking is impressive. Gail has certainly trained you well. You soon realized that Ron had defeated you. Now you're tearfully apologizing to me, hoping that I won't notice your one mistake. I made a mistake in a moment of frustration and intoxication. I believe that I can convince the father of my children to forgive me, especially for the sake of our children. It's a smart strategy knowing how much I love and care about our girls. I am ready to put aside my anger over a mistake in order to protect our innocent children. Of course I would do anything for them. Now I understand that you deliberately wanted to embarrass me in order to teach me a lesson. You also admitted your mistake, which you made while intoxicated when I interfered with your plan. You took responsibility for your actions and apologized to me. What else can you do? The tears stopped, and Amy froze, analyzing my expression and trying to decipher my unspoken thoughts. Without saying a word, I could feel her mind racing, trying to predict the outcome of this situation. Amy, 
I believe your explanation about Ron and the party. I apologize for doubting you and thinking you were having an affair. Now I understand that what happened was a one-time mistake. I believe you when you say it will never happen again. Can we get through this and try to regain control of the situation together? I love you very much, my dear. I'm trying my best to forgive the pain you caused me, but I still have unresolved questions. What do you mean by others? I should have noticed these signs when I first met Gail and heard the rumors, but I trusted you. My intuition kept telling me that something was wrong, and now I realize that I was right all along. I was wrong about Ron, but my fears about you were justified, weren't they? Were you worried? Why should I be worried? I don't understand. Exhaling, I sighed and leaned back in my chair, feeling exhausted by the lies and deception. I didn't have any concrete evidence, but I felt like I'd lost her a long time ago. The woman I once loved was no more. Gail undoubtedly pointed the way to wealth and success, but in the end, it was Amy who chose this path. She voluntarily ignored the promises and began to provide intimate services. It doesn't matter what she did it for, self-esteem, quick profit, or fleeting excitement. The reason for her decision is unimportant. Amy, I know about your actions and that you make so many deals. It really hurts me to see what you've become. The look of shock on her face confirmed my words. It was fleeting, but I caught it before she pulled herself together and smiled. Mark, honey, I thought we were fine, she said. I've already admitted my mistake with Ron, but I have no idea what you're talking about right now. I don't know what you think you know, but I just want to get this nonsense over with and move on. Let's get cleaned up and get our daughters. I know they like being with their grandparents, but they miss dad. That's what we did. I spent the rest of the day admiring my daughters and considering my next steps. On Monday, I visited my lawyer and officially filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Despite the lawyer's warning not to have high hopes, I asked for joint custody of the girls with my primary guardian. In order not to attract my wife's attention, I sent Amy to her job. Shortly after receiving confirmation of successful completion of the service, my phone rang. Are you serious? Are you really thinking of divorcing me because of this situation with Ron? I understand nothing. It was a mistake. It was stupid. We have discussed everything thoroughly. Please think about our daughters. You love them more than anything in the world. I will accept any punishment, but please don't destroy our family. I've already told you that Ron is not the main problem. I can't be with the person you've turned into. It's all nonsense. I'm worried about you. Obviously, it's hard for you to forgive my mistake. I understand it. The divorce situation can have a negative impact on our daughters. We need to find a way to deal with this. Perhaps a psychologist's consultation will help us. Do you want me to organize it? Please sign the papers, Amy. Once that happens, you can live freely. The girls and I can handle it on our own. They can stay with me when you're not at home, and you can visit them whenever you want. Stop dreaming. There will be no divorce. I will never let you take my daughters away from me. Stop this nonsense immediately. If you challenge me, there will be consequences. Mark, I care about you. Please don't make me fight. An hour later, my phone rang, and it was Gail. I was waiting for her call. Order your student to sign the documents. This is the only choice you have. Once she signs the contract, the girls will stay with me and you can continue to exploit her for your clients. Naive boy, you have no evidence that she was engaged in any activity other than the meeting with Ron, which did not take place on my instructions. I'm sure you're savvier. I don't need proof. I have to make this statement loudly and publicly. She has done this repeatedly, and I am sure that at least one of your competitors will be ready to collect evidence and file a complaint. This could lead to an investigation which you definitely don't want right now, right? Are you ready to destroy her out of revenge? Don't forget that the girls will also suffer if something becomes known about their mother. She'll sign the papers, or I'll do it publicly. If this information becomes known, I will definitely involve you in the process. You gave her recommendations on moving to the role of a leading salesperson in our company, 
replacing you by age. Do you expect any requests from the board of directors? Have her sign the documents and follow your instructions. The signed papers were received by my lawyer a week later. Amy has since moved into a nice apartment located about two miles from our house. She often visits the girls and regularly attends their school and sports events. We don't talk much, but recently I saw Gail and Amy coming out of a fancy restaurant. I was just pulling into the parking lot when they came up to my car. Gail opened the door and then turned to Amy and pulled her to her for a passionate kiss. I was shocked. I had no idea that Amy liked girls. Now it's clear why Gail had such a strong influence on her. Now I realize that I never really understood her, but I'm grateful that I'm moving on. I'm not sure if I'll ever get married again, but if I do decide to do it, I'll definitely ask a lot of questions before making a decision. This experience has taught me a valuable lesson.